first question of the day is we all know the Jack Nicholas. Uh, oh, by the way, when you guess once and you're wrong, you can't guess again during the question. You're eliminated. Okay? I, you know, get, I, golf is a game of honesty, integrity, and discipline, and that applies in here as well. So. Uh, we all know that Jack Nicholas won 18 majors. How many times did he finish second? How many times do you think nobody wants to guess first because they want to wake up? I get how that works. I get that was, you know, okay. I'll let, I'll let, in a minute I'll let the dad, dad's and parents answer. Yes, sir. 19. Correct. Thank you. That's for your child, by the way, not you. <laughs> okay. Uh, second question. What is the number of the rule in the USGA rule book? This slide, please. Can I guess? No. <laughs> Plus, I don't think you need golf balls. Uh, what is the number of the rule in the rule book that allows you to play a second ball? Yes, sir. 3-3. Correct. 3-3. Very well done. Oh. I like that. Okay. So here we go. Uh, a lot of this has already been covered today, so I'm going to speed through it fairly quickly. Uh, but I'm here to talk today about navigating junior golf. Linda did a great job talking about that and all the kinds of different tours. And we also had to heard some things about knowing your best fit, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But I'm going to spend a little bit more time perhaps getting noticed by college coaches. So the first thing I want to do is talk about navigating junior golf. And uh, it's a little crazy out there, and I'm going to repeat some of the things that she said. She rattled off some terms like tours and independent tournaments and stuff like that. But when you're navigating junior golf, it's real important to understand and some of you are a little bit further along in this process, some of you are just beginning it, but let me go through the basics to start off with. First of all, you need to understand the types of tournaments. And local events, like the ones the Gap holds, or the Philadelphia Section PGA holds, or even high school holds, are very important. Why? Because anytime you step on a golf course, you're trying to get better. Every time you step on a golf course, you should be trying to set a personal record. How many, what is your personal record for the most birdies in a round? or the fewest bogeys, or the fewest putts. So every time you step on a golf course, it's a challenge. And they're great to stay sharp. You're sleeping in your own bed, you're eating your own food. It's a wonderful way to keep yourself sharp because even if you're playing at a national level, it's important. So you can play in a city championship, you can play in charity events, and obviously you can play in high school. So you got your local events. Then you have your regional events. Now, Gap, I kind of think of being more regional just in Philadelphia. So you got state events, you got USGA qualifiers for the junior boys amateur. Nothing is more pressure packed than playing in a qualifier to make it to the national championship. 36 holes in the case of the boys in one day, 18 in the case of the girls, where every shot counts, and they're only going to take two or three kids from that field. That is the ultimate of being under pressure. Great way to play. PGA section events, obviously to get to the PGA junior, you have to win or be at least win or be a runner up in the PGA section championship to automatically get to go. It's also paid for too, by the way. And then you've got your regional tours. You might get the JGA over in uh, New Jersey, you've got Lehigh Valley, you've got a couple of things going on around here that will really help keep your game sharp. Particularly if you're still learning how to play tournament golf. It's real much. It doesn't make a lot of sense to go out and go to Junior World, spend all that money, go down to Doral, spend all that money you haven't had a good local experience. So you're working your way up here. You're working at local events, you're working up to regional events, and then you're trying to work up to major independent events. And the Q means you have to qualify to get into them. So you got the US Junior Amateurs, both boys and girls. You got the Western Junior, which is pretty much based upon a resume and ranking. You got Junior Worlds, again, qualifiers and a resume. PGA Junior Championship, which I just mentioned, you have to qualify to get into it. The Optimist International, you can get in with a resume if you're a good player, but also they have qualifiers. And obviously we also mentioned earlier the Big Eye, which has usually a local qualifier, usually called the state championship. And again, if you win that, you get your expenses, the player's expenses get paid to go to that tournament. Very nice perk. My son, by the way, just to back up here for a second, I've been doing the junior golf school since 1998. My son is Chris there. 
he uh, was a junior golfer. Um, he went to play at Northwestern on scholarship and was very fortunate to play up there for Pat Goss, as you heard his name mentioned earlier, and uh, played for three years with Luke Dunn. Luke and, Luke and Christopher were contemporaries at Northwestern. Christopher, by the way, never had a desire to play professional golf, but he wanted to be a very good amateur. And that kind of culminated a little bit last summer when he qualified at the ripe old age of 30-something to be in the U.S. Am at the country club. And I was privileged enough to caddy for him. I've caddied, in fact, in three U.S. Am. Uh, but caddy for Christopher was a real, a real pleasure and a real joy. We had a great time together. And then this year, he won the Colorado Mid Am at Colorado and his club championship. So uh, it, it, golf has been a wonderful thing in his life, even as an amateur. And it has made him a lot of connections. He now works, he has a great job. He works at Vail Resorts uh, corporate headquarters, and he has a great job uh, being very well paid. And his boss is very understanding about him going out there in the summertime and competing. He works extra hours to make up for it, but he gets a chance to do it. So golf has introduced him in a way uh, to uh, a lot of different things, even as an amateur. Uh, then, I just, then we need to understand the tours. We've got regional tours like I just talked about. We've got national, what I call national developmental tours. That's like, you've heard about hurricanes starting to move up in this area. You've heard about uh, the plantation you go through, perhaps. The IJGT and the FCWT are not really developmental because usually they, they have a little bit better players in it. But developmental tours are designed for people who are learning to play competitive job golf for the first time. And they're learning to work their way up. And they're trying to build a resume that gets them into the bigger and better events, like independent events or AJGA performance stars. And in fact, the National League Tour, the way I qualify it is, and I don't mean to offend any other tours, but in all due respect, the AJGA is the elite national tour. It, it's hard to get in there. You've got to earn your way into it. You're going to have better players. All the fields are going to be competitive. You're not going to worry too much about whether the fields are only five people. They're always going to have like 60, 70 boys and at least 40 girls, 20 to 50, in fact, 20 to 45 girls. So it's uh, it, so the HAGA is something to strive for. However, it is not the be all and end all. If you don't get into an HAGA tournament, I can tell you dozens of stories about young ladies and young men who got into college on scholarships and never played an HAGA event. It's, if you can do it and get there, absolutely good. But don't be despondent if you don't. All right, you've got to have a competitive plan. All right, building a competitive resume progression life, it sort of goes like this. You build your experience wherever you start. You try to maximize your chances for early success. Play in tournaments where you can do well. That mean, if that means you're playing a 6,200-yard course against some so-so group of high school golfers, and you learn to win, and you learn to come down on that particular day, on that particular Sunday, or whatever day it is, and you're one shot in the lead when you tee off, that counts if you win. That counts, that you have that pressure on you. So learn to build for success, and then build on those successes to go to larger tournaments. As you build up that success, then you'll start to be, able to be eligible for it. So there's a progression. Now, by the way, you heard a lot today about those kinds of tournaments. If you are already an HHEA member, and if you are a college bound athlete subscriber to the HHEA, they have this wonderful four-year timeline on their website that was covered earlier. But, so, don't think you have to remember all this because it's all there. Also on the Junior Golf Scoreboard, under a column called Going to College, a lot of that's written up as well. Budget, time, and money. Tournaments take time, they take commitment, you want to get value for your money. You know, with all the expenses that are associated with a tournament, particularly if you travel at all and have to pick up a motel room or, or, or food, it can get expensive. And don't over schedule. Don't get into a summer where you're playing five weeks in a row. I don't think five weeks in a row proves anything, other than you're going to be tired. So if you play two weeks in a row and take a week off, that's fine. The idea here is not to rack up the number of tournaments. The idea is to play these tournaments in a smart, in a smart way. And I'll, you know, if you have any questions on that, I'll stop in a second at the end of the segment for questions just about this segment. So if you think, if you think, you know, you have to play a lot of tournaments to make an impression, that's not, that's not the deal. It's 
no point in playing a tournament. You just played a tournament not so well. No point in going playing another tournament not so well. Stop, practice, go swimming, enjoy yourself, relax. And if you look at the PGA Tour, you're not going to see any tour, very few, maybe not a tour, but very few tour professionals play more than three in a row. Very few. Because they need to get away. So keep that in mind. All right, the idea, most of all, is to just play. You know, don't get overly excited about it. It's important to get out there and play. You know, no one got better sitting at home. Play at least six to eight events a year. And by year, and this is repeated on the AJGA website. In fact, they do a much better job because it, obviously it's on the website. But after your eighth grade year and below, you can stay local and regional. After ninth grade, you want to play some local events and one or two national events. And don't and play those local qualifiers for those national events, like Optimus, like uh, the U.S. Juniors, like any of the others that require the PGA Central Championship. Because you want, you may not make it the first time. You want to keep getting that experience. So maybe you'll make it after your sophomore year, or maybe you'll make it after your junior year. Tenth grade tours, absolutely state championship. By the way, you should always play your state championship. I don't care if there's an HHGA the same day down the road. Usually HHGA is good about not scheduling tournaments inside a state where the state championship is being held. But play the state championship. There's nothing more proud than to hold that state championship trophy for the rest of your life as a junior. Christopher did it. He won the Virginia State Championship, and he still talks about it. So play, always play your state championship. Uh, and, and see if you can work in some, a couple of national events. 11th grade, you know, the summer after 11th grade, that's, that's the big summer. That's the really big summer, unless you, you know, you're fantastic and you've made an early commitment. You play fewer local events, you play the tours, whatever you get on, and you play as many national events as you possibly can get into. But you're not going to get in those national events unless you build up experience back the previous year. So there's a real progression where you sort of diminish you know, the local smaller tournaments and you start increasing and playing the national events. Now we talked, this was already talked about earlier. So that's kind of like the progression for navigating junior golf. Okay, so let me stop there about navigating junior golf. Any questions about junior golf? Is it what we do or what you've seen or what you've heard about this morning? Huh? Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about the concept of best fit. This is written up on the Junior Golf Scoreboard. Before I do that, how about another question? Who's ready for a question? Here we go. Um, there, are, there, are, there are some pro golfers who have won three of the four career Grand Slam tournaments, but they haven't won the fourth. Okay? I know of three right off the top of my head. Name one. No, that's correct. Well and somebody named the other two? Oh, the other two? I don't know. What? Roy McElroy? No. No. Well, that's, okay. that's great. That's great. You win. I didn't think about it. I was thinking of older colors. The other two, the other two, the other two are Arnold Palmer. Can anybody tell me which, this is, this is an surprise, but. Can you tell me what, what, which one of the four did Arnold Palmer not win? Yeah, very well done. And Lee Trevino, what one of the four did he not win? Good job. Good job. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> I stopped that. You're right, Sam. Watson. Watson? Watson won them all. Watson won them all. No, he won five. He won PTA. That's right. That's right. Okay. <laughs> well, you guys are more on top of that than I was. I stopped after I saw three names. That's enough. All right, best fit. Let's talk about best fit. This is anything you heard today. Finding your best fit for your school, for you matching up with the school, and the school matching up with you is huge. You, if you don't concentrate on this best fit philosophy, you're going to waste a lot of time, and you're going to be much more effective if you work on this best fit philosophy. And again, this has already been covered quite a bit. Research where you will do best. There's two ways to do that. One is the Pink College Golf Guide. Online, Pink College Golf Guide will, will has all the contact information, all the scores, tuition numbers, SAT numbers, everything for a school. 
So the Payne College Golf Guide is huge as a research tool for research where you where you would do best. And here we are. Payne Guide is on there, and then also going to college on the junior golf scoreboard. If you read the articles under going to college on the junior golf scoreboard, which is under the header called off the course, you will um, learn a lot about college recruiting. A lot. They're written by John Brooks, who was a former Division I coach. Ted Gleason, who was a former Division I coach. And Nicky Gens, former Division I coach. There's about 40 articles, at least 40 articles, or maybe more. If you read through those and take the time over the next couple of months to read them, you will understand a lot. And, hear, and you'll hear a lot of them repeating exactly what you heard here today already. <coughs> golf fit. When we talk about fit, are you a golf fit for the team? Do you have the scores? that the team has. A coach is not interested, by the way, in recruiting the number five player. Do you, call, you write, I can beat your number five player. They don't care. <laughs> well, what they care is, can you beat their number two player? Or can you beat their number three player? There was an interesting comment today about, about number kids. In college, by the way, uh, you travel five, you play, you count four. So five people go and play in a tournament. One of the, one of the funny stories I heard was, some coach was asked, um, what's your ideal squad size? And the coach said, six. And they asked him why. He said, because that one person who gets left at home, they don't have anybody to complain to. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you're, a, make sure you're, a, make sure you're a, a fit for the team. Make sure your golf game is where it ought to be. You can go starting next week with the early signing period, November 12th. We, we posted last year 1,000 signees under the rankings and honors page on our website, college signings. 1,000 of them. And you know what, what, what the school, the kind of schools, what caliber player the schools are recruiting? You can go to the signees list and look that up. And starting next week, you'll start to see the signings posted. So if you're thinking about going to a top division one school, you'll see the kinds of players that are recruiting. If you're thinking about going to a D2 school or NAIA, I don't get many of those signings, but I do get some, you can see the caliber. And that goes for girls and ladies. I don't want to, you know, this applies to you just as much. You can see the kinds of caliber of players that are recruiting. And in fact, I will tell the ladies in this room that if you play a decent golf, you have a wonderful opportunity to Why? Because there are more scholarships available. There's more money available, and the squad sizes are small. In addition to that, 46% of all the top Division I rosters positions are filled by foreign players. And foreign players are always a risk in some cases. Culture adjustment, language adjustment, all that kind of stuff. But the women's coaches on the women's side, and particularly Division I, will always try to recruit a good American player. So you have, you have a little bit more of an edge than the guys do. I, you need to make sure that academic fit is there. And by the way, nobody has said it before, but the three most important things you need to think about when you want to be recruited to play college guys are grades, grades, and grades. They have to get you through the admissions department. In Division I, if you, are, you have a coach's interest, they cannot make you a financial offer until the admissions department says, yes, that kid will fit here. So they literally have to walk it down the hall. So grades matter. So keep your grades up. Does, you've heard a little bit talking about this. Is there an academic program fit? You're, you're there primarily to get a degree. So do they offer the course of studies that you're interested in? If they don't have a business finance department, and you're really interested in business finance, don't go to that school. I mean, you, you know, you're probably, Colin Montgomery said something very interesting in a, in a, in a TV interview. They asked Colin Montgomery what, um, what was the most important thing that helped your golf career? And his answer in that interview was, I got my college degree. Because he said, I knew that if I didn't make it on the golf course, I could earn a living and I had something to fall back on. So it made me relax in the golf course. So I thought that was very interesting and very telling that Colin Montgomery would say that. Make sure it's a financial fit. In Division I, there are very few full scholarships. Very few. Typically, it's 
15, 25%, maybe 30 or 40%. There are no athletic scholarships in Ivy League. There are no athletic scholarships in D3. Yes, there are grants and stuff like that, but you need to understand what the costs are going to be. And that includes travel costs. So, uh, it, you know, the cost, of, the cost of the education is not just books. By the way, a full scholarship in Division I or in Division II, a full scholarship is tuition, room and board, books, and all fees. Tuition, room and board, books, and all fees. So don't panic when you hear that somebody whose parent is sitting with you eating pancakes and show me one morning. They say, oh, my kid got his full scholarship. Oh, really? Did they get tuition books? Oh, no, no, they just got the tuition. That's not a full scholarship. So remember that. Uh, and there are very few of them, very few. My son was fortunate enough to get a 60% scholarship at Northwestern, and then it progressed and got more and more each year while he was there. Uh, but typically, typically, it's a lot less than that. A lot less than that. Because they're going to spread the money over like nine players. into an immense team, and maybe seven or eight players. Now, on the women's side, Division I, it's more likely there's a full scholarship or closer to it, just because they have more money to do. So make sure you understand what your financial obligations are going to be, so that you have a correct financial fit after all said and done. And a campus fit. You like living there? You want a rural campus? You want a city campus? You want to, you know, you, know, you want to, you want to go to Ohio State, with forty thousand students? Or do you want to go to a smaller rural campus where there are two thousand students? I went to St. Lawrence. I loved it. I didn't play golf for them, but I loved it. So you know, your campus life is a big part of it. It's a big part of it. You know. And I can tell you a number of kids I've worked with that have gone and visited schools, and one of the things the kids say is, well, I just didn't like the campus. So make sure you like the campus. And, and that includes a lot of things. That includes the golf facilities, that includes what campus life seems to be like, where you're going to be living. And distance from home. Travel is part of the expense of getting back to the school. If you're within two hours of home, then it's, you know, half a bank against. But, you know, make sure that that's part of your equation in the best fit category. So best fit, best fit, best fit. There's an article on the Junior Golf School Board in the Going to College tab that talks about best fit. And so every advisor that you get, mentor you get, or anybody who talks to you, helps you through the process, is gonna talk about the concept of best fit. So I was really glad to hear today that that was, an under, that was a theme that was going on the whole time. And I was gonna skip over this presentation because it mentioned, but I said, no, no. I want to make sure that everyone fully understands what the best fit philosophy is. Okay, questions right there. Any questions? I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, Lisa said, I think you said four and a half scholarships per team right. on a D1. On a D1. Do you have figures like that for the ladies? Six. Six. 6.0. D1. So that means if, 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 if all, everything all in is $20,000, which it isn't anymore, that's $120,000 the coach has to divvy up if he's fully funded. Now, not all schools are fully funded. They don't, the NCAA will allow you 6.0 for the ladies and 4.0, but not all schools are fully funded if they give scholarships. They may only have enough money for three scholarships. So, so let me just get huh? that. You can go to my conference. So. Yeah, go to my conference too. So then you're talking about one, one and a half per incoming freshman. No, because you've got to spread it across everybody. Yeah. That's what I meant. So yeah. if you get six, you yeah. might have three seniors graduating. You know? Yeah. Cool. Yes, sir. What are those numbers for D2 for girls? 4.5? 4.5. 3.8 for men. 3.8, 4.5 for D2. 3.6, sorry. 3.6? Yeah, three point, sorry, three point six. So. Now there are over one thousand men's golf opportunities across all college opportunities in the country. So every one of those schools needs two guys a year. That's two thousand players a year they need to recruit. That includes D one, D two, D three, NIIA, and junior college. 
Some of you may not be academically seasoned enough and you want to do two years at a, at a junior school. They have some very competitive golf teams. And it's a great way to kind of build up your transcript and be able to get you to transfer to, do a, to, a, to another program to finish your last two years. So, any other questions about best fit? Yes, sir. How about for what? On what level? On Division two. Oh, how many scholarships in Division two? Yeah. On well, how many schools are there? Oh, uh, 150, I think at least. I have a grid. I didn't bring it with me. But if you, by the way, on my business card, on your table, my email address. Please put a Mac M A C. T for Thayer after the Mac. I just changed it to get rid of the span. So it's Mac T. And if you email me, if you email me, I'll send you the grid. Show you, show you the numbers. Okay. Any other questions about best fit? Yes, sir. Just a comment also. You mentioned about having resources at your disposal, like your small scoreboard, as well as the college archive. So as a coach, I have talked to a lot of coach. I will say that. Pretty much every college ball coach has a junior ball school board, as well as also the main college, uh, the college ball back at their disposal. And I think it's a good idea that any respectful college ball board also use those tools because in some ways you can kind of better know what the coach is looking at. And also with the uh, with main college ball fight, you can feel the fit. That golf file does a very good job in terms of uh, giving you uh, giving you a limit, kind of giving you a good first look at every single program in the country. So I just want to make that, that comment. Make sure it's not overwhelming. Anything else before I ask my next question of the day? Okay. The next question of the day, who has the most runner-up finishes at the U.S. Open without winning it, and how many are there? And how many? Bill Nicholson says. That's correct. Make sure that gets to your child, not to you. So they use your golf here. <laughs> okay. No, I guess it. That's correct. Uh, one more. Uh, the last player to have a top ten finish in all four majors in one season. Lori, one season. Very nice. Yes, sir. That's correct. All right. Let's move on. <laughs> All right, getting noticed by college coaches, what does it really take, All right? Here's, you've heard some of this today already. Having a best fit strategy is the number one item on your list. Number one item on your list. When you tell a college coach, dear coach so-and-so, by the way, congratulations on your team's blah, 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 finished last week. Uh, well, you know, congratulations that your team played well. That shows you that you've done the research. But knowing the best, I, you know, I want to study such and such at the school. Here's why I believe I'm a fit for your program. When you individualize your cover email or your cover letter that way, in the first three sentences, you'll get their attention. So that's why you need to have that best fit really ingrained in your approach to going to college coaches. All right, it's all about being visible and as I said, being the right fit for their program in school. Those are the two elements. I would probably, if I was going to do that slide again, I'd throw that being the right fit, number one. And the second ball is being visible. How do you how do you get on a coach? On the junior golf scoreboard, the coaches have access to what's called the coaches corner. And they have uh, various levels of services that they can purchase or get for free. And one of which is a recruit folder. Your goal is to get into that potential recruit folder. Your goal is for them to say, where have I seen that name before? How did I hear about that? You know? And so your goal is to get that recruit folder. So let's understand how coaches find players. There are three basic ways coaches find players. Number one, their own research. They notice you, results, rankings, or they're at a tournament and they see you play, or they see you hit balls on the range. So that nobody told you, nobody told them about you. They discover them, discover you on their own. The second way is if someone contacts them about a player, they might have a college player who plays with you in a qualifier, and they call the coach up and go, oh, I played with this kid, he's pretty good coach, you ought to take a look at him. They might have an alumni call and say, hey coach, you know, I got a kid at my club, he's pretty darn good. 
or they may get contacted by a teaching professional who knows them. So your professional who's giving you lessons might contact. So some third party is giving them some indication of who you are. And then the third way is that you contact them. You know, and you control that. That's the part you control. You can't control two, the first two, but you can certainly control that last one. So those are the three basic ways that coaches find players.